right. Welcome to the second invited talk session. We're happy to have Peter Schwaber giving this talk. Peter, after doing his PhD time in Eindhoven and his postdoc time in Taiwan, joined Radboud University Nijmegen and then most recently MPI, that's the Max Planck Institute for Security and Privacy in Bochum. Peter's had a big influence on the NIST post-quantum competition. For example, NIST asked everybody to submit optimized software for ARM Cortex-M4 microcontrollers and then compared performance on those microcontrollers. But that was because, well, much earlier, Peter and a bunch of his students said, all right, it's really interesting to look at what post-quantum performance is on these microcontrollers. And so they picked a good one, the ARM Cortex-M4, and started optimizing and benchmarking a bunch of schemes for that. And then NIST came along and said, Yep, looks good. Within the competition, Peter has seven submissions, which is particularly interesting because unlike a lot of other submissions, zero out of those seven have been shown to be breakable in a weekend on a laptop. Peter also has the maximum number of submissions that have been selected by NIST for standardization. So without further ado, um, Peter Schwaba is going to give us a talk on the ghosts of the NIST post-quantum competition, past, present, and future. Peter, the stage is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, Dan. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, thank you very much, of course, to the organizers for inviting me. And uh, while I'm at thanking everyone, I also have to apologize uh, because I will probably not be in many of the other sessions. And the reason is that I'm in parallel um, at the Security Week in Graz, where I will be giving a talk tomorrow. So I think I'll prioritize uh, the in-person event here in Graz. And I'm now sitting in a, in a small uh, room of the university. I hope that the internet won't leave me here. All right, so for this talk, I should, uh, the talk as the title may suggest has, uh, has two parts. It's a, it's a looking back part and it's a looking ahead part. And I should say from the beginning that this talk is very biased because of course, as we all know, no matter what NIST says, NIST PQC is a competition, but also it's biased in a different way. So. Um, I think what I will be giving here in this talk is mostly the view of a cryptographic engineer. And I think had you asked anyone else from the teams that I was involved in, you would have gotten a very different view. Also, it's maybe not the talk that, I don't know, people who invited me had in mind when they invited me. So um, I think the obvious thing to do would have been to speak about like one or two of the candidates that, uh, or the schemes that have now been selected for standardization that, uh, that I was involved in. But I've recently given quite a few talks about Kyber, and I felt slightly bored about giving such a, another such talk. I also felt that probably at PQ Crypto, most people would feel the same and uh, don't want to see yet another lettuce-based chem talk. So I decided to do something else. And um, well, my thought was the following. Uh, this post-quantum competition, I think, was at the same time a, a big challenge for, for our community, and it was also a huge chance, a huge chance to well, to show what we're capable of as a research community and to make real world impact. And uh, now we've experienced six years of it, roughly. And some schemes have been selected for standardization and will now go through standardization, will be deployed. And I thought it's maybe a good moment to look back a little bit and um, look at, well, what went well and what didn't go so well. And because I don't want to finger point too much, you know, at some of the badly failed submissions maybe, um, I decided at least wherever possible to point to work of other people whenever I'm referring to something, when I need an example for something that went well. And whenever I need an example for something that didn't go so well, I'll uh, refer to our submissions. And I hope that my co-authors and co-submitters will forgive me for that. Uh, when I say our submissions and co-submitters, uh, here's the three schemes and the, the teams that I was involved in that have now been selected. So that's Crystal Skyber, Crystal Silicium, and Sphinx Plus, as everyone knows. I will skip reading out all of the names, but I would like to mention in particular Vadim Lubyshevsky, who was the uh, principal submitter of Crystal Silicium, and Andreas Hulzing, who was the principal submitter of Sphinx Plus. And for Kyber, it was me. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to look at sort of the tasks that our community had in this competition, and I We'll subdivide this in uh, five disciplines that I believe we were sort of engaging at. It's, uh, they're, they're not all very, very cleanly separated, but they, I feel like there's, there's five categories or five disciplines that we, we were involved in, and I look at how well we did. 
And the obvious first category is designing. To introduce this, let me start with a quote. And that's a quote which sort of motivated the title of the six years. Um, and that is from PQ Crypto 2016, a bit more than six years ago, when uh, Dustin Moody gave a talk and uh, on the slide said that a complete written specification of the algorithms shall be included consisting of all necessary mathematical operations, equations, tables, diagrams, and parameters that are needed to implement the algorithms. The document shall include design rational and an explanation for all the important design decisions that are made. Now, thinking back a little bit about designing, I felt like it was a funny cultural clash almost. And sort of the nicest way to explain what I mean by that um, is a very recent experience that I had when working on a joint project with my colleague, Giulio Malavolta. So Giulio, I think it's fair to say, is um, on the somewhat more theoretic side of cryptography than me. And while we were working on something together, we're designing a scheme, and uh, as so often in cryptography, we uh, needed some problem, some underlying problem to be hard. And in the discussions, I mentioned that it would be kind of nice if we could get rid of this assumption because this problem is not very well understood. And then Julia replied, but it is, right? I mean, it, it, it's a hard problem. I said, okay, so, so what parameters do we choose? At which point Julia said, oh, you mean numbers. And I think this is really something that when you're looking at the asymmetric crypto community, like going all the way from something that maybe you have in your mind as a, as a mathematical description to something that you can really implement. There's so many design decisions to be made that in academic papers we can usually skip. So we definitely have to choose concrete parameters for different security levels. But we also have to make real implementation choices like, for example, all the randomness do you, that, that you need, do you just read it from the system random number generator or do you read the seed and expand it yourself? You need to figure out how do you actually do the sampling of certain distributions? For example, if you need a fixed noise distribution and you might want to do this in constant time, you need to say that you do constant time sorting and you might even want to look at what algorithm you're using for it. You need to select all the symmetric primitives. I think all of the candidates that, that were submitted and we've seen what happens when you don't. Now, in these decisions, the question is, did we actually do this well? And of, of course, I mean, there were 69 schemes at the beginning. We would expect that some didn't do so well. But how about the schemes that in the end got selected? Well, it wasn't all that well either. Um, here is one example from Dilithium. Dilithium, um, in rounds one and two, had parameter sets for NIST security level one, two, and three. And then for round three decided, Oh, let's actually go for also something higher security. Let's, let's revisit those, those parameters and those security levels that we want to target and went for NIST security levels um, two, three, and five. Now for level five, what we forgot to do is to revisit the choices of symmetric crypto in there. So there was a message hash, or there is a message hash, and we used a truncated message hash, truncated to 384 bits which is fine for lower security levels, but for this security level five, doesn't give you uh, the sufficient collision resistance. So the document was updated. There was a version 3.1. At some point we received an email from NIST. It was actually NIST who spotted that. And they pointed out that we might want to go for 512 bits there. There's another example, also from one of the schemes that are now chosen for standardization, um, Sphinx Plus. Now Sphinx Plus, if you've read the security proof, um, I didn't write it, but I read it, and I have at some point been convinced by the proof. Um, we need a property called distinct function multi-target second pre which resistance of the underlying hash function. And there's three different hash functions that you can use to instantiate things, plus there's SHA-256, SHAKE-256, and Haraka. And only very recently, it was pointed out by Sidney Antonov, namely, well, April this year, that SHA-256 doesn't actually have that property. Well, it, it does if you don't want to go all the way up to levels three or five. But the attack cost against this property is lower than well, what you would need to achieve level three and five. And here's a very nice way how uh, Andy replied to it. He said, this is an interesting attack to demonstrate 
that are real hash functions do not behave like perfect random oracles, or perfectly behave like random oracles. So even though we don't have a random oracle assumption there, in our mind, we still treat hash functions often like random oracles and just assume that all of the properties that we kind of want them to have, they just have. Dot 256 doesn't. So, well, how well we really did in terms of designing is, I think in the end, there's two questions that will need to be answered and they will only be answered by time. And that is, first, will the schemes that have been now been selected be widely deployed and widely used? And the second one is, will they survive? I'm generally, I think, known to be a very optimistic person and um, I'm, I'm optimistic about the first one. So I, we're already in discussions with, with multiple potential users. We have already over the past few years seen multiple public experiments with some of the schemes that were in rounds two and three. So I am optimistic that there's maybe not a pervasive deployment, but a very wide deployment. If they survive in the long run, well, time will tell. Second, discipline is proven. And let me open this one with a, call, a quote from the call for proposals, which said that submitters are not required to provide a proof of security, although such proofs will be considered if they are available. So it wasn't needed, but if you look back, at least the schemes that went fairly far in the competition, they typically did have some attempt of a proof at least. How well are we doing? Oh, not so well. I can say that in Kyber round one, well, what we did is we um, used the Lubashevsky Pike Regev scheme, which has a public key that is just A times S plus E. And under an LWE assumption, we can assume this to be uniform in the proof. Well, it might be depending on which instantiation you use, it's a ring or a module LWE. In Kyber, it's a module LWE sample. But then what we did is in the public key, we compressed this. So we just rounded off some low bits because they're not really needed. And then on the other side, we decompressed it again. However, that introduces a bias. So it's definitely not uniform anymore. And that breaks the proof. So the reduction from module LWE in round one Kyber was simply invalid. Or as NIST very nicely phrased it, is that they note that the potential issue is that the security proof does not directly apply to Kyber itself, but rather to a modified version of the scheme, which does not compress the public key. In round two, we removed the compression of the public key. Here's another example, again from Sphinx Plus. So as I mentioned, the Sphinx Plus security proof um, is rather complex. It's quite a beast. And um, there's some parts in there that had a reduction from second pre-image resistance, where you have some hash chains and you place a challenge somewhere. And then the forgery produces a pre-image um, of X with a certain probability. And the reduction then basically hopes that you find a pre-image that well, gives you a second pre-image. And that kind of uses the fact that if there is a pre-image, there is also with overwhelmingly large probability a second pre-image, which unfortunately isn't the case because it's length preserving hashing. And actually there is a pretty high probability that there isn't a second pre-image if there is one pre-image. So now what an attacker could do, at least potentially, you could just identify if there is a second pre-image and refuse to do anything if there exists a second pre-image. Now, when you look at the proofs and how they failed, I think I find it quite interesting to see all kinds of different failure modes. So there's definitely the failure mode that the proof is simply wrong. But well, that doesn't necessarily mean that the, the, the theorem is also wrong. Maybe you know, the proof just needs to fix it. And the theorem is still fine. It could also be that the theorem is also wrong. But then even if the theorem is wrong, it could still be that the scheme is secure, or at least it doesn't necessarily need to lead to an attack. Maybe this means that the scheme is efficiently broken. Then there's the very, very common case that there is a proof, but it doesn't apply to the scheme. It's in a way, it's a special case of the proof being wrong. You're just not proving the right thing. Or you can say, well, the proof is correct, but it doesn't really mean anything for the scheme. Sometimes the proof is correct, but the theorem that it proves is somewhat insufficient. And um, an example of this would be that some attacks can be hiding in non-tightness of the proof. 
And we've seen this with MQDSS, another scheme that I was involved in. That, as Dan mentioned, was not broken in a weekend on a laptop, but there was at least some attack. And then sometimes the proof and also possibly the theorem are just too vague. So you can't even tell if they're sufficient or if they're doing the right thing. And sometimes they're just not very useful. So if you have a reduction saying that a scheme is secure, if the scheme is secure, that is a theorem that is typically very correct and also fairly easy to prove. But it doesn't really help us for anything, except that there is a section that says security proof in the submission or in some paper. How about discipline three? This is sort of my discipline. It's the implementing discipline. And here I can start with a quote from my session chair. Um, Dan wrote in October, on October 5, 2018, that NIST PQC, despite being an important and timely project, has produced the largest regression ever in the quality of cryptographic software. This will not be easy to fix. How bad was it, really? Well, I would say pretty bad. Here's the first bug that I had to deal with. It was a bug in Delithium. And there was a bug in the Delithium sampler. And what we did there is we basically made sure that every two consecutive uh, coefficients were the same, which leads to a very efficient key recovery attack. There's a few cool things to mention about this attack. So uh, remember that the description of the schemes went online on December 21 at least as far as I remember, it was December 21. And this was less than a week later that Peter Pestle contacted us and told us about it. Now, I can tell you it's not exactly the kind of mail that you want to receive during the Christmas break. It's anyway, not the kind of mail that you want to receive at all if you take pride in the quality of your software. But it was remarkable how quickly this bug was discovered. Also, it's not the kind of bug that would make necessarily make me sleep badly in the long run, because it's something that would be discovered if we had a set of trusted test vectors. So, of course, we didn't have a set of trusted test vectors because it was the first implementation of the scheme ever. But I would believe that this kind of bug would be caught in the long run, you know, if more and more people start implementing the scheme independently, and then at some point they obtain different test vectors, and you look at them and you, you identify that well, one of the two implementations is wrong. The bugs that make me sleep bad at, badly at night, occasionally at least, are bugs that even testing doesn't catch because they're triggered with extremely low probability. And, well, if you know that they're there, you can craft inputs to trigger them and learn something about secrets. So we know that these bugs existed in pretty much all cryptography that used big integer arithmetic. There's some carry bugs with carry bits that are almost always zero. But at the time, at least in December 2017, I was also pretty convinced that maybe such bugs don't exist for lattice-based cryptography, or more generally, several domains of post-quantum cryptography. I'll come back to that in a bit. The other exhibit that I would like to bring forward about the quality of software was a project that was joint work mostly with Matthias Kahnwischer, Joost Reinefeld, John Skank, Doug Skivila, Gotham Tombada, and Tom Wichers. There were a few other people who also submitted to this project, but those were the, the most active people in this project. That's PQ Clean, where um, we set up a test harness for PQC implementations and continuous integration tests. And they integrated reference implementation and basically ran them through this test harness and then cleaned them up. And we also wrote a paper about it. And in this paper, there's a table showing how many flaws we found. And, well, let's say we found lots of flaws. And some of these domains, you would say, okay, for example, that some code didn't compile under Windows because it was using variable length arrays. That's a debatable one. Um, memory safety is not debatable. If you have something that is not memory safe, um, this is undefined behavior and the computer is literally allowed to do anything with your code. Um, there's a few other ones like that code. It's just nicer if you don't have that code that people stare at and try to figure out why the implementation ever worked and then only realize that it works because that code has never actually been used. As a summary in this paper, what we wrote is that in almost every scheme, we identified unclean code, ranging from missing casts to memory safety problems and other forms of undefined behavior. Now, let me come back to these bugs that make me sleep badly at night. Um, here's a screenshot of GitHub. 
and specifically about uh, some implementation of the inverse entity in Kyber on the Cortex M4. You don't need to read the text. I'm fully aware that it's rather small, so the relevant sections I copied out. The relevant section is that two layers of addition subtraction might overflow in 16T. I wonder how you deal with this problem in the FSpec code and why does it still work? Well, the answer is, on your question on why it still works, I believe that this is an edge case that does not get triggered by the testing scripts. So this is exactly the kind of code that even if you run pretty extensive tests and with randomized inputs, maybe even potentially some smarter fuzzing, although I didn't try this, that would be interesting, um, you won't hit that bug. If you find it, you can probably exploit it. This was not the only bug of this style. There was another one um, where this was in, I think, Saber. There's a bug, yeah, it was in Saber. There's a bug in the inverse entity in Saber, but the bug is triggered with a very low probability that it's not triggered on test. So we do still have these kind of bugs in post quantum crypto software, and well, they should probably make us worry to some extent. Fourth discipline, attacking. So one nice way of putting it is by Bruce Schneier from August this year saying that the idea is that participants put their algorithms into the ring, and then we all spend a few years beating on each other's submissions. This is the one domain where I feel like maybe our community has been doing a pretty good job. We have seen quite a few pretty, pretty impressive attacks. Um, very interesting attacks, I must say. And I was not very much involved in the attack game. I was a little bit involved in one of the attacks, but even that one was not my idea. So what stuck in my mind is mostly two attacks. They, to me, they stand out. And this is a biased talk, so I might as well just uh, remind you of these two. Of course, there was the attack by Bart, but Bart has his own, um, his own invited talk, so I won't mention this one. The first one is this one. It's the first attack, actually, that was presented in the NIST post-quantum competition. It was by Lorenz Pani. It was less than five hours after the schemes appeared online, when in these few lines of Python code, he broke the candidate guess again. He called the Python code guessed once. So the impressive thing here is that this recovered the plain text from the cipher text without even looking at the public key. And at some point, uh, I was talking to Lorenz. I don't know if he's, uh, if he's listening right now. But I was talking to Lorenz, and I asked him, OK, so this attack is impressive, um, that you got it written in such a very concise way in, in, in Python and everything. But explain one thing to me. There is 69 submissions, most of them with more than 50 pages of submission documents. And how did you even figure out which one to attack and then you know, understand it and look at the code? And what Lorenz answered was, well, there was a two-stage process. He first looked at the submissions where the specification documents were written in Word and not in LaTeX. So that already filtered out most of them. And then among the ones that were written in Word, he looked at the ones that clearly had claims that can't be true. And this one claimed unconditionally secure public key encryption, which, as we know, is not possible. So that's is how he started looking at it. And then relatively quickly just broke it. And then there's the second attack. Um, I don't know if I need to say anything more than this. Probably most people look at this by now and, and they know exactly what I'm talking about. For those who don't, um, this is the Castric decree attack against SIDH and SUNC. I cannot claim to understand the attack. Um, I know that it will take me quite a while to actually read through the whole paper and understand it because uh, I haven't been working on isogeny so much, and the time is when I've been looking at elliptic and in particular hyperelliptic curves. It's also some years ago. But I can share a story with you. So the next day, so after this attack, I received an email from a journalist. And this journalist sent me this email three questions. The first question was, um, does this attack affect any of the schemes that have been selected for standardization also from, well, co-designed by Ruhr University Bochum? Obvious question, no. Second question was, does this attack affect any of the traditional elliptic curve cryptography that we're using every day? Uh, pretty obvious answer, no. The third question was, can you explain in one or two sentences to a layman how the attack works? And well, the answer was no. 
There's a few things that, though, that I can mention about this attack that I found, like just looking at it from quite a distance, extremely impressive. So SIDH was a scheme that has been described as a decade unscathed by Craig Costello. And it, it was, there was really no, no improvement in, in the cryptanalysis. Actually, what we've seen is that one of the very, very rare examples in cryptography where attacks do get more costly. Well, they didn't really get more costly, but they have been analyzed in more depth. And this analysis showed that they're more costly than originally believed, which I think made it psych the only scheme in the NIST post-quantum competition that at some point lowered their parameters. It's also a scheme that not only has been around for 10 years, or somewhat more than 10 years, but I know that several really smart and competent people have been looking at it and trying to break it. One publicly known example is by, uh, by Chloe Martindale and Lawrence Pani, who wrote a paper about their failures to break SIDH or PSYCH um, in and, and, and a C-fail paper. But I have talked to other people in the elliptic curve community who have been looking at it and have been trying to break it and failed. And still, we saw a complete break without any warning. And honestly, I find this pretty humbling for our community and for what we do, to see that these things are happening. Usually, I think we trust that, okay, attacks do happen, but they don't happen like this. Now for the fifth uh, discipline. And that is, uh, oh, sorry, um, before I come to the fifth discipline, there's actually been some interesting thing to observe when I'm talking about attacks. That is that, sort of in parallel to the NIST competition, there was another kind of attack that was more in the news than, than what the post-quantum community has been doing. And this is a new, um, big set of microarchitectural attacks, new attack ideas on implementations. This started with the Spectre and Meltdown papers, but then there's various other papers that came afterwards. I think most recently, the one paper that got a little bit of attention on the PTC forum mailing list is the Hertzbee paper. But that was only, I think, because they chose Psyche as the example to attack in their, in their paper. And I found it remarkable. I looked back at the, at the emails in the PTC forum, and I found it remarkable how little attention these other attacks have been getting in the context of implementing post-quantum cryptography. So we always have this idea that we want our implementations to be constant time, but then when we're being shown that constant time is insufficient for even remote attacks, to protect against even remote attacks, nothing happens. I'll come back to that in the second part of my talk. Now for the fifth uh, discipline, communicating. And to start that one, let me start with a quote from Bordecock from August 17, 2022. Or said, I don't know if you're familiar with this website, twitter.com. If you like crypto drama, this is where you go. Except if you go to the PQC forum, which is also, generally, it's even better. This is a quote from a Bohr's RAM session presentation at Crypto, entitled My Hot Crypto Summer. And I put the link to the full talk. And it's not a joke, it actually starts at 2022. Okay, so what can we say about communication, about communicating and about the PQC forum? Well, we're computer scientists. We sort of have a reputation of not being particularly good at communicating. So, well, what's there to be said? There's one thing that I, can, that I learned about communicating, um, and that is in a series of conferences that I'm co-organizing. It's the High Assurance Crypto Software Workshops. And those workshops, they're facilitated by uh, Alan Gunn, Gunner, um, from, from Aspiration. And Gunner has quite some experience running workshops and facilitating them, and actually quite some experience communicating. So there's this quote from the, uh, from the guidelines of Aspiration events, which is the rule of one and rule of n. So what it says is that when you're in a, in a meeting, so these guidelines are written for, uh, for personal uh, meetings, discussions in small rounds, you know, five to 10 people. And it says that when you speak, make one point and then let others speak. And when in a group of N people, speak about one nth of the time. 
Now, PKC Forum is not a group of five to eight people sitting around a table. And I don't think we should necessarily expect communication to follow this rule in an online forum of such a competition. And clearly, there's the NIST employees who are involved there who are running the show. You would expect them to speak more. Um, then there's a few people who just write once to announce a conference, and then afterwards are also totally fine. But it made me wonder, like, how unbalanced is actually the distribution in the PQC forum? And um, does that say something about our community? So what I tried to do is you download all the mails and you run statistics. It turns out that Google Groups do not have the most convenient interface to download anything or really to access anything in an automated way. I found two crawlers on, online for Google Groups. They both don't work. And I already spent way too much time on this slide, so I did not decide to write my own crawler. However, um, I decided, OK, I actually have almost all mails. More specifically, I ran this uh, like about two weeks ago before chess when there were a total of 666 threads in, uh, in, the, in the Google groups of PQC Forum. They're called conversations in the, in the Google slang. And the first email is from Dustin Moody from August 1, 2016. I have a total of 2,805 mail in Bernstein to Chris Pikert. So what did I do then? Well, I just took a look at um, who's sending. It's pretty, well, not a super easy thing to do, but it's just a few lines of bash. And I'm sure that if you care more or are better at bash than I am, then you can write this in a much shorter way. And there's a total of 369 sender addresses. Sometimes there's multiple addresses for one person. So for example, I noticed that Andreas Hulsing is sending from, or has been sending from two addresses about equally much. There's 131 addresses that sent just one mail. And I'm really hoping that these are the kind of mails of like, hey, we have a workshop that's maybe interesting for you. And not people sending one email and then getting replies that scares them off and they run away. There's also 275 addresses, well, including the 131, of course, that send at most five mails. So again, I'm hoping that these are not people who got scared away by the discussion culture on the, uh, on the list. But still, that leaves almost 100 people who are at least somewhat engaging in discussions, I mean, sending more than five emails. So how about the top 10? Here's the distribution at the top 10. Um, top number one is with 407 out of the 2008. So that's about one seventh of the emails. And then it goes down. And it turns out that actually place number 10 is shared between two people. OK, let me de-anonymize a little bit here. So there's a couple of people from NIST. And I guess it's fair to assume that these people would be writing just more emails than others. There's lots of communication threads where really people are asking questions to NIST and then get replies from NIST. And let me also de-anonymize myself. So I'm down there at place number 10 with 47 emails to the list. Now, if you look a little bit further, you see that actually 50% of mails are sent by only 15 people, which really means if we think that we have a big community discussing and making decisions here or helping with decisions, it's actually not that big. And I really wish that we would be, I don't know, more welcoming, more inclusive, just getting more people involved in this discussion and, and get more inputs here. Yeah, the internet died here. Uh, so I completely disconnected Wi-Fi and reconnected Wi-Fi. I'm sorry about that. Um, yeah, it says video webcam sharing is starting. I don't know what that. If I need to do anything to to make that happen, or if it's yeah, and I can't. Uh, it looks like, okay, so I need to check here. So I can see my slide. Um, let me see what I need to do here. You are now muted. Oh, okay, so I, I should be able to. You are now unmuted. So maybe I continue. And even if you don't have my video, you can still see the slides and, and hear me talk. I don't know if the video, maybe the video comes back, but. 
Um, so the green light of the camera is still on and I tried that. At the moment the button is grayed out and it says webcam sharing is starting. Ah. Yeah, okay. Sorry for that. Uh, it's, uh, okay. Okay. So, um, yeah, technology uh, and new cards. Hopefully, the Wi Fi will now survive for the rest of the talk. Um, so, yeah, so 50% 50, 50 of mails were sent by only 15 people. So if we believe as a community that we're um, having discussions with like a, a broad, uh, broad community and that, that decisions are being advised to NIST by, by many people, it's actually not so much the case. Uh, when I told about this uh, result to one of my colleagues, he immediately said, so how about by characters, by email? And, um, it's very tricky. This is the moment when I learned much more about email than I ever wanted to know. It's not easy to count uh, characters written in an email. And mostly the reason is that, well, some people write HTML only email, which is a bit annoying, but that's not very many. What is more annoying is that many people use very different styles for um, quoting other emails. So I believe that the following statistic is correct. Um, just, I did not go by character, I went by word, but I believe it's correct that 30% of all words by non-NIST authors are from just one address. And um, well, when I saw this, I ran it by someone with a PhD in communication science. I, I actually did. And uh, the comment I got is that this is not a typical pattern that you would see in um, forums with a healthy discussion culture. So maybe as a community, we should be doing something about it. And well, I'm also in the top 10. So I'll also try to be uh, a bit more, a bit more careful, maybe, and hopefully uh, welcoming um, in the future. Okay, so let's look ahead. Let's look at uh, my part two of the talk, and uh, clearly, what we can be expecting in the next months and years is just more of the above. So more designing, proving, implementing, attacking, and communicating through rounds four, five, six. Let's see where this goes. What I'm very much hoping is that also the algorithms that have now been selected for standardization um, receive additional scrutiny. We hope that they're not broken, but if they get broken, I'd much rather have them broken as soon as possible before all of the world has been migrating to these algorithms. And then, of course, we will see standardization and deployment of the selected algorithms. Now, what I want to talk about in the remainder of this talk is some approach that hopefully improves a bit in the areas of proving, of implementing, hopefully also some additional scrutiny, and also in deployment. More specifically, what I want to talk about is an effort to formally verify crypto, and at the moment, well, mostly post-quantum crypto. So this is a project that is called Formosa Crypto, and it's not a project in the sense that um, we applied for funding and wrote a large proposal. It's a project in the sense that several people have already been working for many years on some things and uh, several more people have been joining fairly recently and we just want to work towards this goal of having more confidence in the crypto that we'll be using in the next few years. There's three main projects in the, within this effort. This is the Easy Crypt Proof Assistant, which is already around for a pretty long time, but it keeps evolving and it keeps getting new features and it keeps getting better at also dealing with post-quantum cryptography. Um, there's the Jasmine programming language, which is what I will be talking about most uh, in, the, in the next few slides. Um, it's a very low level programming language that is amenable to, or lends itself to, um, to formal verification and at the same time to get very high performance. And then there is LibJade. It's a cryptographic library written entirely in Jasmine. Uh, we had been hoping to have a first release ready by Chess. We're now hoping to have it ready for um, AsiaCrypt in Formosa, so in Taiwan. The core community working on this, of, I would say roughly 30 to 40 people, including well, a few senior researchers from the institutions that you see there on the right, 
a um, couple of PhD students, postdocs, uh, doing great work. Um, we also have a discussion forum. Um, I haven't done any statistic analysis there. Uh, it's a discussion forum with a little more than 100 people currently. So there's several people, I think, who are mostly following what's going on and some others who are using this to, to actually push this effort ahead. Here's the typical tool chain and workflow that we use in Formosa Crypto. So um, there is to get high speed, formally verified uh, post quantum crypto, we implement the schemes in Jasmine. And uh, the Jasmine compiler then uh, does three things. It has an automatic, automatic safety checker. So we know that the code is memory safe. Um, it compiles to assembly, and that compilation is uh, provably correct, of course, under certain assumptions. Uh, for example, the assumptions that the semantics of the assembly instructions are described correctly. Um, it also extracts to EasyCrypt. So then in EasyCrypt, you have a, a model of the Jasmine program. And then you typically use interactive proofs to um, establish all kinds of properties about usually some high-level specification um, of the scheme and also establish a link between the EasyCrypt model of the Jasmine program and the specification. Now, I'm mostly, as I said, it's the engineering view of this. So I'm mostly working on the, on the right side of this, uh, of this project. So I'm mostly working on uh, implementing in Jasmine, on, on optimizing in Jasmine, um, giving input to people writing uh, the compiler and, uh, and improving the language and the language features. And um, I started this in, in 2020 when I visited Manuel Barbosa at the University of Porto for what was planned to be a four-month sabbatical, which was shortened by the pandemic to about one month. Um, but I must say, I very much enjoyed working with Jasmine. The syntax is very much C-like, um, so it, it's fairly easily readable, but it's still assembly in your head. So the compilation is much, much more predictable. It's usually just one line in Jasmine translates to one line in assembly. There's very few exceptions to this rules, but even those are very predictable. Um, there's no scheduling happening to the code, so it, the instructions don't get permuted around or anything. Um, the compiler does not spill registers, so that means that you need to take care of spills yourself. But that means that also syntactically correct code may fail to compile because you don't have enough registers available. The compiler is formally proven to preserve semantics. So that's what I meant on the previous slide when saying that it's a certifiable compilation. Um, the compiler is also formally proven to preserve constant time property. And then you have a separate compiler run, which takes quite a while to ensure memory safety. And that is done statically. So it's not like, for example, in Rust, where you insert some runtime checks to ensure memory safety, but the language is just limited enough that you can prove um, memory safety statically. So there's no runtime cost involved in this. And when I'm saying that we have um, constant guaranteed constant time code, well, the way that this works is that at least it, it used to work differently, but fairly recently it works roughly like this. So um, Jasmine uses an information flow type system. It distinguishes for each item of data, for each register, for each byte in memory, um, it distinguishes if that byte is, uh, or that item is secret or is public. And then it traces that through the computation statically. So whenever you have an operation where uh, one input is secret, then the output is also secret. Um, then you prevent branching and memory indexing on secret data. So the two most notorious sources of timing leakage are eliminated. And the cool thing is, I mean, all of this you could in principle also do in Rust. The problem if you do this in Rust is that the compiler is fairly likely to eliminate all of this because you can do it on source level, but the compiler doesn't understand any of it uh, through the later stages of, uh, of compilation. In Jasmine, the compilation is proven to preserve the property of constant times. However, what we do goes, goes even beyond this, and this brings me to why I had this slide with all of the attack logos in there earlier. We now have, for Jasmine code, guaranteed Spectre v1 protection. And the idea here is, for those who are not familiar with Spectre v1, the problem is that um, a processor on a branch may misspeculate the branch. So whenever there's a branching instruction, the CPU just decides go one way or the other. And if it goes the wrong way, 
then it continues along that path and performs executions. And at some point notices, of course, that it went the wrong way and, and undoes everything, except it doesn't undo really everything. So you may have already, through this speculative execution, leaked some secrets. So the problem there is really that you may have a register that is marked as public, but during speculative execution may contain secret data. And well, because public data is allowed to leak, it speculatively then leaks the secret data. So the way that we're solving this is that we extend the type system and we have an additional level between public and secret, which is called transient, which means it's public data in the real execution, but it may contain secrets during the speculation. Then we keep a predicate around to track misspeculation. And whenever we're loading, um, whenever transient data enters a leaking instruction, uh, we're masking it before that, so that it becomes zero in a misspeculated execution. This approach is called speculative, uh, selective speculative load hardening, selective SLH. And in a very recent paper that uh, we just put online this week, uh, we show that the performance overhead for crypto is larger than 1%. Uh, smaller than 1%, sorry. Uh, this is a joint work with uh, Vasavel Shivakumar, Gilbert, Benjamin Grégoire, Vincent Laporte, Thiago Oliveira, Swan Priya, and Luca tabadi monja And the paper is called Typing High-Speed Cryptography Against Spectre People. The project that we're currently mostly working on and hopefully wrapping up at least soon-ish, uh, we're expecting that the paper will be available soon. So this is still work in progress, it's formally verified fiber. This is what we started uh, in 2020 when I visited Manuel in, in Portugal. And what we do in this project is we, we have two implementations in Jasmine of Kyber, including the underlying CPA secure encryption scheme and, and the, um, the tweaked FO transform to achieve active security. And those are being compiled down to assembly. On the other end, what we're doing is we're extracting them to this uh, easy crypt description, and we have a mechanized proof that the two are functionally equivalent. And then we take these uh, descriptions and we prove also in EasyCrypt that um, this implementation, the reference implementation, correctly implements a concrete model in EasyCrypt. The concrete model is basically an EasyCrypt re-implementation of the pseudocode from the specification of Kyber. And then we have a more abstract model. This is the hashed MLWE EasyCrypt model. And we, we show that under certain assumptions, um, the concrete model is a refinement of this abstract model. And then this concrete model is being used to establish that the uh, CPA PKE scheme, the uh, passively secure encryption scheme underlying, is actually in CPA secure. And that through the uh, tweaked FO transform, we're getting in CCA security. And this is joint work by now with a lot of people, which also took quite a bit longer than I had originally anticipated probably also longer than Manuel had anticipated. So this is uh, with uh, José Bastelar Almeida, Manuel Barbosa, Gilbert, Benjamin Grégoire, Andrea Silsing, Vincent Laporte, Jean-Christophe Lechnay, Thiago Oliveira, Hugo Pacheco, Miguel Caresma, Antoine Serré, and Pierre Stroop. Now, just imagine, when I show you this, uh, this approach of uh, computer verifying implementations, and computer verifying proofs, what if NIST had required computer verified software proofs back in 2016, 2017, when they wrote the call for proposals? I'm pretty sure that, well, the talk that I would have given today would have been very different, but also I believe that we would have had way fewer bugs in PQC software. I also believe that we would have much higher confidence in all of the proofs that we've seen. I believe that the attacks could have been much more focused because you basically know exactly which assumptions are there. They are very, very explicitly written down and you can attack any of these assumptions. And maybe also we could have heavily reduced noise in our discussions. I'm also sure that probably we wouldn't have had any single submission. If that sounds appealing to you, then um, I invite you to get involved. Uh, as I mentioned, we have a discussion forum, which is on Zulip. So it's formosacrypto.zulipchat.com. And I also invite you to check out the Formosa Crypto website, which at the moment is mostly the logos of the institutions and then links to the three projects, EasyCrypt, Jasmine, 
and libjade. Thank you for your attention. You are now unmuted. Oh, okay. You are now muted. Yeah, sorry, just uh, had to reconnect audio and stuff because um, wandered off for the uh, for the talk. Um, okay, so let's see. So far, I haven't spotted questions on Zulip, but uh, I had a few questions myself. Um, regarding the uh, high assurance um, Kyber uh, implementation that you're just talking about, um, once this is all uh, like fully done and released and everything, um, do you anticipate extending it to cover other platforms? Which, uh, I mean, how easy do you think it's going to be if people are saying, "Oh, I, I need this working on on some more environments." It's a very interesting question. So at the moment, um, we have the very simple limitation that the Jasmine compiler fully supports only AMD64. However, um, about a year ago, an effort started to support multiple architectures, uh, which first required well, separating the architecture specific parts from all other parts in the compiler. Um, and then as a, as a second architecture, the compiler now partially supports 32-bit ARM. So um, there is the idea of extending this to, for example, some implementations that are in PQM4, re-implementing them in Jasmine. Um, I would hope, because we have that reference implementation, which is basically mostly using 32-bit and 16-bit integer arithmetic, I would believe that most of that can be fairly easily rewritten to compile for ARM32. So of course, it's not the same language that compiles to both architectures. It's, it will be. Um, a different Jasmine version needed for, like a different Jasmine source code for each target architecture. But it's maybe not terribly different. Um, how much the proofs carry over, um, they will need some changes. Uh, the correctness, I mean, the, the, the security proofs will be the same, but then connecting the um, ARM code extracted to EasyCrypt to the specification will be some manual effort. We're also currently working on some more, more proof automation there because this is where a lot of time went, and uh, you only want to burn through that many PhD students, I think. So this is really this really needs some, some more automation. Um, so yes, it is planned. I think I've, I've become much more careful about predictions, how much work anything is in, in, this, uh, in this realm. But I would hope that it's way less work than um, starting again completely from scratch or something else. Okay, question from Fabio Campos in the in Zulip chat is, hi, Peter, thanks for the wonderful talk. Is there, from your point of view, any plausible explanation for not having computer verified proofs as a necessary step within NIST's or any standardization process? Um, the interesting thing is that NIST didn't even require any proofs. Um, I'm not, so, my understanding, and maybe there's, I see that there's a few people from NIST also here, maybe they can actually answer that question better than me. My understanding was that NIST wanted to be very inclusive in, in terms and not have insane submission requirements. Um, for example, when you look at the quality of software that was submitted, I think you could have been much, much more strict and, and just remove many, many more submissions, but this was not. I think uh, requiring computer verified proofs would exclude many, many people who are extremely competent in designing uh, cryptography in, in crypt analyzing uh, cryptography and basically doing everything else. And I'm not sure that this would have helped at all to get submissions. Um, there's also the sort of joke, I'm stealing this now from Jill Bard, that if we required computer verified proofs for all uh, crypto papers, then we wouldn't have the problem that we get uh, already too crowded even with dual track but we would have just way, way fewer papers in the community. Um, I think it would be really good, at least for the schemes, when they get really far in the competition, to, to try as a community to go for an effort and verify them. I think a scheme that gets eliminated um, through 10 lines of Python code after five hours, requiring the effort of um, computer verified proof is maybe overkill. More efficient ways to remove them. 
the proof topic is attracting more questions. Boyan Yang is asking, could I ask how many PhD student hours had gone into proving by proof assistance uh, have already gone into Kyber? Way too many. Um, so uh, I, I was not involved really in the proof, very, very little bit at the beginning, but then I left Portugal too early. Um, definitely way too many. Uh, it's, it's hard to tell. There's so many people and uh, months, months of work. I have an echo now. So yeah, m m really months of months and months and months of work have gone uh, into, into the proofs there. Yeah, sorry for the echo from my audio equipment here. Um, there's a uh, question from Christina von Vredendahl. Uh, did you analyze the emails on the Formosa forum? I did not. I did not. Okay, another question. Now, this one is not related to proofs, as far as I can tell, from Mohamed Gundogan saying, you asked a question, will those schemes survive in the long run? That was your second question on the two questions to be resolved. Uh, the question continues, even for exponential attacks, usually it's advised to move to better, uh, to move, I think it says move to better algorithm. So not only for the practical attacks, but also for the theoretical attacks, we have the risk of the cost of moving to a new algorithm. Which scheme minimizes that risk? What do you think? For signatures, it's fairly easy. Um, I would say that hash-based signatures minimize the risk. Um, of course, there there was the the attack against Sphinx Plus very late um, by making assumptions about the underlying hash function. But at least the princi in principle, I think the construction is uh, is yeah extremely confidence inspiring to me. Um, for chems. I find it hard to say. If you want to be um, paranoid secure, I would say combine something code-based, classic Michaelis, with something lattice-based, Kyber at a high security level, um, and throw in elliptic curve crypto anyway. So anyway, like anything you do, I've uh, been telling this everywhere, it's maybe a good occasion to repeat this. Um, combine with elliptic curve cryptography, do it hybrid, uh, and um, Okay, there's a comment from Daniel Smith Tone from NIST that uh, doesn't have a question, but let me just read out the comment. It says, proofs are not an insane submission requirement, but yes, we want it to be inclusive and have a robust package to present to the community. Um, a different question that I was wondering about, this is a very technical one and maybe we should take it offline, but um, I, I was wondering since there's a recent Intel announcement regarding constant time, sounds like some of the Intel multiplication instructions are maybe not constant time, but it's, it's hard to figure out which ones or whether Intel actually knows what they're talking about there. Um, is this something where you'd be able to extend what Jasmine is doing to be able to say, let's avoid whatever instructions turn out not to be constant time, for instance, for, for multiplications, if that's the case? Um, I should double check with the people who actually write the compiler, but that should be pretty, pretty easy to do, I have my understanding. I and mean, you would want to exclude this only on secret data. And the, the nice thing is, of course, that with the information flow type system, we know which data is secret, and then that, that should be totally doable. Um, it's, it's on the to-do list, so we've already looked at the list and uh, already discussed this a bit. Um, yes, should be, should be doable. All right, great. I don't see further questions in the Zulip chat, um, and we're about at time at this point, so um, I think we're going to call it quits on this. Uh, we have half an hour until the next session, and um, everybody sitting at your computers, please uh, applaud for yourselves. Uh, thanks, Peter, for the nice presentation. Thank you all.